Okay. So welcome everybody to uh, this meeting of the Emeritus College Travel Group. And today we're going to have Rick Stokes talk to us about India. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that I live in the unceded ancestral and traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And there may be people living in other parts of the uh, country who uh, have joined our Zoom meeting and I acknowledge that there are other nations. Um, I'm going to ask everyone who, to mute your microphone so that we don't have extraneous noise during this. And uh, I will try to mute uh, those people who haven't muted themselves, but it would be much nicer and easier if people just did it. Thank you. I'm going to hand over now to Rick and ask him to introduce himself. And I think uh, he's there with uh, his wife, Moya, who also participated in this trip and uh, let him take it away. So Rick, can you share your screen now, please? Uh, yes. Oops. And ah, I seem to have lost you. No, it's still there. It's still there. No, it's gone. It is. It's not there. I've lost you. Well, uh, it should be there. Try at the bottom or at the top. Uh, where it has participants, uh, chat, and anything else. I've got it now. You found it? Sorry about that. No problem. Right, share screen. There we go. Okay. And you can make it a full screen if you possible. Go to the... Yeah, now I can't get rid of the top thing that's no, no, just, just go down at the bottom where it has an icon that looks like a screen and click on that. It should make it full screen. There you go. That's it. Got it. Perfect. So uh, I am uh, Rick Stokes. I used to be uh, at uh, Children's Hospital at the uh, Family Research Centre there. And I'm going to be talking about a, a trip to we took to Gujarat and Rajasthan this year. So it was in February and March of uh, of this year. We spent about five weeks uh, doing two tours of, of the states of Gujarat and Rajasthan in northwest India. And the first tour, which was about three weeks, uh, covered cultural aspects of the area. And uh, I'll be covering some of that, talking about the numerous cities, towns, temples, stepwells, forts that we saw. And after that, we took about a two-week tour on looking at wildlife and basically it was still in Gujarat and Rajasthan, but it went to different areas where we visited safari parks in the main to look for large mammals. But of course uh, there was always birds and a couple of spots we went that were predominantly for birding. So we'll start off uh, with India some many years ago, I think it was about 2005, we had a trip to the southern parts of India, went to Hyderabad for a conference and then tagged on a trip to Kerala and Tamil Nadu to uh, do some birding down there. We had a lovely time, but this time we uh, got the opportunity to join a tour of Rajasthan and Gujarat up in the northwest bordering Pakistan. So the two states were quite different. Gujarat, there's uh, no alcohol sales within Gujarat except with a, a permit that is allowed for especially for tourists and then you can buy alcohol at government shops but you can't buy them in in restaurants or anything like that nearly everywhere we ate was pure vegetarian if not vegan and uh gujarat was mostly not that touristy you might say and it had a very varied geography rajasthan on the other hand is uh, very different alcohol was okay throughout you could get meat in the restaurants, even though our choice was a bit limited. Uh, much more touristy in the in the places we went, the, the three main cities in Rajasthan. And uh, a lot of the state is, is desert. So it's quite different from our southern trip. 
And we started off on the uh, call it the cultural tour in the city of Ahmedabad. And on our first day, we visited this, the Swami Narayan temple in Ahmedabad. Quite the beautiful thing. And uh, you probably can't read that, but there's a, every temple we went in, uh, Hindu temples we went in, there was segregation of the ladies and the gentlemen. We went into different areas of the temple. And our, our tour, there was, uh, I can't remember, I think it was five ladies and me, the only male. And the guide was male, so we kept separating in the temples. So the Swaminarayan Sampradaya, uh, which was what this temple was connected to, it's a Hindu Vaishnava Sampradaya. And you have to excuse my pronunciation of, of Hindi words. I'm obviously not a local. But uh, Vaishnava meant that they consider Vishnu is the supreme deity and Sampradaya just means tradition or sect. So uh, the Swaminari and Sampradaya is, is just one of the Hindu sects. Uh, Vaishnavism is very common in Gujarat. It's their, Vishnu is their favourite deity. The particular Swaminari and Sampradaya is characterised by the worship of uh, the founder, who was called Sahan, Sahajanad Swami, but better known as Swami Narayan, and he lived from 1781 to 1830, that he's considered an avatar of Krishna or of Vishnu, Vishnu's 24th name, which is Purushottahama. So uh, that particular Sampradaya considers him a, 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 a deity, basically. And that the temple in Andabad was the very first one to be built. Or well, now, now there were several throughout uh, Gujarat and other parts of India. Inside, absolutely gorgeous, like all the temp Hindu temples. This one was predominantly a uh, wooden structure, uh, beautifully carved and painted, all sorts of colourful bits and bobs, really nice. We also wandered around the city, Ahmedabad, and uh, throughout we saw these um, very large um, um, sort of constructions that were basically, they were bird feeders that had been set up. They're called Jabutros, and they're, they're found throughout Ahmedabad and Gujarat. We saw them elsewhere as well. And uh, there's, there's great respect and care for animals throughout Gujarat, and it's consistent with a vegetarian diet. And as we wandered around, there was these street scenes we came across. And lots of street wildlife. So here's the first bird. He's a, a house crow, very common in India throughout. And it's the equivalent of our American crow or Northwestern crow. And you can see also that they build their nests in uh, any location they can find around. Also, there's lots of dogs in the streets. They're mostly feral. Uh, some of them are domestic dogs, but mostly they're feral. And they, they like to take up any place for a, a rest and a sleep. This guy's looking after his master's uh, scooter, it appears. Lots of goats wandering around and cattle as well, of course, but we'll come on to the cattle later. And they're helping themselves to any food they can find. In Ahmedabad, we also visited um, a mosque, the Jama Masjid, which um, translated Friday Mosque. And it was built in 1424. Now, this place was uh, an active mosque, and so it was men only inside, and that caused some friction with the ladies in the group. They weren't allowed into the, this area of the mosque. And it was typical of the mosques we visited lots and lots of pillars and of course much uh, less decoration than you'd find in the hindu temples so from andabad we went on then to visit the sun temple in Madeira and the rani kivav stepwell in patan so the the sun temple it's a 11th century hindu temple and it's dedicated to the deity Surya. It was consisting of an assembly hall here, the shrine hall here, and this 
step well type setup uh, a reservoir. There's um, lots of Indian tourists visiting the place as well and throughout, and you'll see in a lot of my photos, the, the beautiful saris that the ladies wear in India, all sorts of colours, really makes photographs pop. It's quite lovely. And the step well was uh, also very photogenic. Inside the assembly hall, there was all these... Uh, beautiful sandstone carving on the, the pillars and the uh, arches and the roofs, all sorts of figures and patterns decorating. It must take ages to do these carvings. And one of them, very peculiar, it depicts an execution by elephant. So the, the poor victim is laid down and a, an elephant just puts all his weight onto it and squashes him. Here, there's some strong man lifting a baby elephant. All sorts of figures that you see carved into the, the walls and on the pillars, as you see here and here. But we also came across this group of uh, Russian sun worshippers who were in the temple, and I think they were visiting other temples as well. One of our group spoke fluent Russian, so they were able to converse with, with them to find out what they were doing. Outside, hidden away in one of the corners, was a, a spotted owlet, this, this fellow here, who was roosting for the day. And obviously he was uh, got his own little place there. And in the reservoir, there was some turtle life as well, and nearby some tourist life. Again, some nice shots of the Stepwell Reservoir with the beautiful saris. This chap here, the men, men folks don't wear such colourful clothing in general, but uh, this guy had a nice yellow shirt on. After that, we then went on to the Rani Kivav. The, it's called the Queen's Stepwell. It's 11th century construction, and it's in the town of Patan on the banks of the Saraswati River. It had been silted over for a long, long time, but uh, was rediscovered in the 40s and finally finished restoring in the 80s. Uh, it was designed as an inverted temple and divided into seven levels. And the sculptures all over the walls and the, the pillars, about a thousand minor and 500 major sculptures with all sorts of religious, secular, symbolic imagery. So you can here see uh, four levels of the seven level step well and you can see the carvings in the walls you get a bit closer and we can start seeing some of these figures that are in the carvings here a dancing lady here a god i think that's uh, one of the manifestations of shiva i think again some more dancers gods And more here. All, all done in sandstone in this um, step well. So after that, we moved on to a, a town called Bouge. But whilst we were driving there, we came across this Jain temple en route. Uh, Jainism is, is one of the Indian religions, uh, similar to Hindu in many ways, but they have some major differences, one being that they believe the universe has always been there and always will be there. It was not created. So they're a bit more like cosmologists, I would say. But some absolutely beautiful carving in this uh, honey-coloured sandstone, uh, some of which is um, painted black. It, this isn't uh, ebony or anything like that. It's just painted black sandstone. But the, this honey-coloured sandstone was absolutely gorgeous. And again, intricate carvings everywhere. And even more so, there was uh, statuettes around. And there's this one of a, a, a dancing goddess, I think. But interestingly, the body was made up of smaller dancers. So it was a, quite an intricate carving. 
we uh, arrived in Buj and <clears throat> found that it was in quite a, a, a bad state. There'd been a terrible earthquake in 2001, which destroyed and damaged most of the city, as you can see there in this building. And restorations are ongoing. They're slowly getting there, but there's a lot of work to be done. And there, Swami Narayan Temple had been uh, gravely damaged in the earthquake. So they'd built a new marble temple a short distance from the original site. Cost about a billion rupees, which is 16 and a half million Canadian. Opened in 2010, mostly made of marble. And inside was absolutely gorgeous. It's photographer's heaven, it was. There was these wonderful pillars. And we were there at, at sunset in late evening. And it brought all sorts of coloration to the marble, these pink colors in the background. And you can see here, obviously, the marble was predominantly white. And then, uh, of course, all the saris that were being worn by the ladies, like here, added greatly to the, the visual impact of the place. And again, you see here this lovely coloration that's coming from the sun going down at the back of the temple. Some wonderful carvings, as, as would be expected there, gods and, and dancing ladies, all are done in marble. And again, some more interior shots. As uh, the, the sun went further down, it started giving a sort of lilac tint to the marble. And the sari is really added to the the uh, the visuals in the temple. Really beautiful. Some more here. And then as we left outside, the sun setting produced a lovely coloured sky behind the temple. These are not real cows. They're statues that have been carved. So after Buj, we then went on to an area called the Great Ran of Kutch. And whilst there, we took a trip on the road to heaven, not the stairway to heaven. So the Great Ran of Kutch, it's sometimes called the White Desert. It's a huge salt march, and it's about 7,500 square kilometers. It's one of the largest salt deserts in the world. You can see it just stretches on seemingly into the horizon. Very popular with uh, tourists, both Western and Indian. One of the common things there was camel rides. Some people were taking them. I say all these camels were, uh, they weren't, these aren't tattoos they're painted on, these patterns and strange hairstyles, but lovely uh, saddles and all the men are dressed in traditional outfits. Here's a, Chap got a bit bored. Looks like he's having a bite of his pal's tail, but that's really just perspective. But again, you see the beautiful coloured uh, saddles. And here's a, <coughs> one having a little rest. And you can see this strange looking hairstyle and tattoos. Not, like I say, not tattoos, but painting all over the body of the camels. So the road to heaven, it, it's a highway that spans about 30 kilometers through the great run of Kutch. And it gives you a great view of the uh, salt plain. Construction began in 2019 and it was still ongoing as we drove it. There was a lot of roadworks uh, slowing things down. As you can see, here, it's just expanse of, of salt on either side of the road. Quite, uh, an amazing sight. And strangely enough, there was quite a significant flock of juvenile greater flamingos that were present there. And they're able to um, live in these areas. I mean, throughout the world, you see them in Africa as well, where they live in these very salty um, areas because they're so tolerant. They, their legs have very thick, scaly skin, which is, um, isn't burnt by the salt that our skin would be and they're able to filter out salt as they uh, feed on the brine shrimp from there we went to a town called mandvi and that's uh, it's on a coast uh, 
and it's got a 400 year old ship building center there that we visited where they build these large ocean going dows. You can see how large this is by scale to the, the motorbike, mostly built with hand tools, some, some power tools, but mostly hand tools. Here's an example of a PAL tool. Here's a, a industrial sized bandsaw, which this dog is taking advantage of for an afternoon nap. Hopefully he'll move before it gets going. Uh, this chap walked by with the humongous sized carrots on his back. From Manvi, we went to Gondal. Uh, as we were driving down there, we came across this uh, um, li little group of Rabaris on the road. And the, the Rabaris are a nomadic pastoral community, um, commonly found in the northwest especially Gujarat. They're, traditionally, they, they kept camels, but they've uh, recently moved more into sheep and goats as well. But these chaps were just walking along the side of the highway, three-lane highway, and they suddenly decide they were crossing over, not even paying any attention to the traffic. They just set off and all the traffic had to come to a stop whilst they did it. And we saw this with herds of cattle as well, going down three-lane highways, holding up the traffic. When in Gondal, we stayed in this lovely um, hotel called the Hotel Orchard Palace. And it uh, used to be a, the local Maharaj's summer residence. But it had been like many of these old palaces have been turned into hotels. Really lovely place. And they too have a Swaminarayan temple in, in Gondal. Similar marble. Beautiful building. And this time we were allowed inside uh, during one of the services. You can see here's the, the ladies area and I'm in the, the men's area to the side. But beautifully carved and painted pillars and ceilings. Really gorgeous. And at night we stayed uh, for this special light show where they they gave the story of Swami Narayan. And uh, obviously couldn't understand it, it was in Hindi, but... The light show which was projected onto the temple itself was absolutely amazing. It was uh, quite the sight. The next day we visited the indoor market there and uh, you can see all these uh, vegetables for sale. And outside more vegetables and these are uh, just snacks that can be purchased and the ubiquitous tuk-tuks that you find in India. This one I thought was quite good because of the small goats being taken from A to B. Uh, significant amounts of chilies for sale. I don't think I could have handled one of those even. And then here, lots of, as you see all through India, these small stalls by the side of the road. This one here, is for making a uh, a sweet drink by crushing sugar cane. Uh, as I'm a diabetic, I kept away from that sort of stuff. And here you see these single servings of snacks and all sorts of things wrapped up in plastic pouches. And it, it leads to one of the major problems in India, the, the amount of plastic waste that you see on the streets and everywhere in the towns. It's quite unsightly. Wandering around town, we came across this lovely shot of three dogs looking like they were set up for the Olympics, gold, silver and bronze, best in show. And uh, here we get to the cows found throughout India, wandering around the, the streets of towns and cities, actively encouraged in Gujarat. There were uh, drinks and food was put out for them because, of course, they're sacred to the Hindus. And this one was even trying on some clothing. It uh, mainly, I think, to shield itself from the sun, but uh, it was quite a nice photo up and this beautiful material. I wish it had been around in the 60s when I was an old hippie. From Gondal, we moved to a place called Palatana. And that's um, a, a large complex of temples, Jain temples 
located in the Shatrajaya Hills. It's uh, about 900 small shrine, shrines and large temples. Uh, it's one of the most sacred sites of the Svetambara, which is the white clad tradition within Jains. Uh, everybody wears white in that tradition. The members are expected to make a pilgrimage to this site at least once in their lives. The earliest temples are in the 11th century. And to get there, you have to climb up to the top of the hill using 3,500 stone steps up the hilly trail. And if you need it, you can hire a palanquin to be carried up. But uh, we, we walked up and then unfortunately had to walk down 3,500 stone steps, which was much harder. Recently, they have banned photography completely within the temple complex, which was a great shame. And it, the, the story that explained this was that there'd been a theft of jewels from one of the temples, but how that meant you had to stop photography was a bit of a mystery. So anyway, couldn't get any photos in there, but managed to take a couple on the way up. And this was some of the 3,500 steps. I was zigzagging up them to make it and was constantly being overtaken by little Jane nuns who were skipping up the steps at a rapid rate. But you can see how steep it was towards the end as well. From Palitana, we moved to San Trampur, where we stayed in the best hotel of the trip, the Sri Jorava Villas. It was a beautiful sort of semi-decadent and distressed looking place. It was really wonderful. Sited on the, a lake, you see the hotel here. And on the lake was a couple of mugger crocodiles. And one of them was out basking in the sun. So they have a, a little boat that they took us for a, a trip around the lake to look at the crocodiles. And then just here, there are a load of streak throated swallow nests which uh, I was just taking a show, shot of, and this pigeon photo bombed me. So it looked all right, so I kept it. Nearby was the Raj Mahal Palace in Santrampur, uh, owned by the same people who owned the hotel, and they're uh, hoping to uh, restore it to become another hotel. But it looked like it needed a lot of work, even though it's still, again, in the sort of distressed look it uh, still quite beautiful in many ways you can see here still all this lovely carving that you can see so from there we moved on to Rajasthan we flew up to Jaisalmer the golden city and then a trip to Jodhpur the blue city finally Jaipur the pink city Jaisalmer is the golden city it stands on uh, yellow sandstone and uh, its predominant feature is the, the fort. It's got a royal palace and lots of temples and residences. Houses of the temple and the temples of the fort and the town are in this yellow sandstone, hence the name Golden City. The town's in the heart of a desert, the Thar Desert. Uh, it's got about 80,000 population. Founded in 1156 by Jaisal Singh, and that's how it got its name, from Jaisal and Mare, a Mare meaning fort, so it's the Fort of Jaisal. The Fort Palace, uh, we went one sunrise to get some shots of the Fort Palace, which is next to one of the main gates, entrances. Reminded me very much of uh, Gorman Gast Castle in the Mervyn Peak novels if you've ever read them made me think of that anyway but major pigeon roost and dramatic in color or black and white depending on your choice in the evening we went back and you can certainly see why it's called the golden city now in in the sunset it's this beautiful yellow sandstone really pops out reddish gold a lot of people live within the fort and uh, it's faced in quite a lot of threats because of that. There's increased population, puts pressure on the, on the fort. And there's a lot of derelict houses, so it's, it's definitely deteriorating. But you can see these 
patios from all the residences that are to be found throughout the fort. And you also find many havelis, which are the traditional townhouse, or much more appropriate to be called mansions, in and around the fort. Uh, there's th three major ones of uh, Patwa was one of them that we visited. They were the elaborate homes of the uh, very rich mer merchants within Jaisalmer. And they decorated their townhouses with this beautiful carving on the windows to re reflect their wealth and their status within society. And as you wandered around, you saw these beautiful havelis, beautiful carvings. You also come across this a lot, the, the uh, telephone and power lines uh, that just lead to a, an awful mess of wires hanging everywhere. Again, some more shots of the havelis. Beautiful golden sandstone. This particular... Uh, street level window frame was being used by a lot of people to get selfies but again got photo bombed by a pigeon some more Haveli windows absolutely gorgeous and in one of them the Patwa Haveli there was a museum inside that we visited and the uh, ceiling and wall decorations were just I mean way over the top basically but really colourful and lots of this uh, reflective material. And outside, as we wandered around, there was all these, uh, I love these things, these little alleyways that go off to somewhere you don't know where. And you've got to be careful, though, because there might be a motorbike or scooter come flying down. But uh, very intriguing alleyways everywhere. And street life, as usual, lots of goats and cattle. And this one was uh, particularly amusing because he seemed to be uh, trying to earn a bit of extra cash by being a, a taxi. Throughout Jaisalmer, we came across uh, small shrines, statues and paintings of Ganesha, obviously very popular in this town. And I must say... Any kind of god with an elephant's head is got to be popular, I'd have thought. From there, we moved to Jodhpur. That's the second largest city in Rajasthan, with about uh, getting on for two million population. It was the capital of the Kingdom of Marwa, uh, but uh, since 1949, it's become part of the state of Rajasthan. It's called the Blue City because of the dominant colour scheme of buildings in one area the, of the old city, Brahmapuri, that translates to the town of Brahmins. So this, these upper-class families adopt the colour. It's one of the stories, at least, is it, it reflected their socio-cultural piety in the Hindu caste system. Another explanation is that the blue coloration helps to keep the houses cool. Uh, the place we were staying, there was lots of these Northern Plains grey langurs. I was able to get a couple of nice shots here. But we not, did a, a trip around the old blue part of the city. And you can see here this uh, wonderful contrast of the old and the new forms of transportation. Just beautiful blue buildings and the... Uh, saris that went with it really make for an attractive photo all of buildings are a, a shade of indigo it's uh the, the, apparently it was fairly common in the area so they used indigo and now they also have mules on the wall a lot of these um uh blue houses though that they're, they're disappearing uh, as you can see here not everybody likes to paint their houses blue the, the younger people think it's an old tradition they don't want anything to do with it so it's slowly disappearing and along with the blue houses you get these lovely uh, shutters and doorways as well that make for great photos and some more of these 
alleyways that lead who knows where. Also in uh, Jodhpur is uh, it was a major stepwell, the Turji Jalwa stepwell. Quite steep that uh, no way I was going any closer than where I was getting this photo. Certainly not going down like this fella did. Nearby was a, a market called the Clock Tower Market where they were selling all this beautiful, colourful material. And of course, there's the Merengar Fort, which dominates uh, the, the scenery. Again, looking very gourmand in its uh, sort of size and old oldness. Again, beautiful carvings everywhere and massive walkways, probably for horses and perhaps even for elephants. And there were some interesting characters dotted around as well. This this is the most ridiculous facial hair I've ever seen. A guy smoking a hookah and someone playing a Ravanahatha. Ravana I think that's how you say it, which is a member of the violin family. Inside the buildings, there was lots of coloured glass, which made for quite uh, beautiful light patterns. We then went to Jaipur, uh, the, the capital of Rajasthan, the largest city of about 4 million. It was founded in 1727 and then became the capital in 49, 1949. It's got two World Heritage Sites that we visited, the Amar Fort and the Jan Janta Manta. And then, of course, there's this much photographed Hawa Mahal, the Palace of Winds. It's... Uh, on the edge of the city palace and it's for the it, it was the women's chambers built in 1799 by the maharaja there it's got 953 small windows with intricate lattice work so that this allowed the royal ladies to look at everyday life and the goings on down in the street but without being seen by the the uh, the riffraff inside the palace it's basically a royal residence and, and it was the um, administrative centre of Jaipur. Uh, and it was completed in 1732. Within the, the building, we saw these, there were two of these humongous sterling silver vessels, about 1.6 metres high, could carry 4,000 litres of water. And it was for the uh, Maharaja when he visited Edward VII's coronation, he wanted to take Ganges water for, for drinking. So he had to get these two 4,000 litre vessels to do so. Some beautiful doorways all around the palace, beautifully painted and carved. And then we visited the Janta Manta, which is a stone built astronomical instrument. Um, designed to be used by the naked eye. And this, because uh, of the Raja Jai Singh, who had five of them built throughout uh, Rajasthan, was very much interested in astronomy. Here's uh, one of the um, instruments. I'm not quite sure how they work. It's not my area of expertise, but they were quite dramatic buildings. This was some kind of fancy sundial, I think. This is my zodiacal sign, Aquarius. And as always, there were some lovely shots of, of saris against the sandstone backgrounds. We also visited the Amar Fort. Uh, that's about 11K from Jaipur. It overlooks the Mahauta Lake and it's uh, quite a, a large building. You can get up to it by uh, on the backs of elephants or in a jeep, depending on your choice. Absolutely packed with tourists. This is the entrance to the museum area. There were people everywhere. Much like most of the towns in Rajasthan that we visited. Part of the uh, in, inner palace was this uh, Jai Mandir, also called the Mirror Palace. So it was built with all sorts of mirrors and re reflective materials. 
and they were designed such that when uh, candles were lit, you'd get this glittering effect. Of course, we couldn't see that in daytime, but still very beautiful. So that was the uh, end of our cultural tour was in Jaipur, where we were picked up from uh, for our to start our wildlife tour. We went to first this town called Berra, where we stayed in the leopard lair Ananta Elite. And the target there was to see Indian leopards. We were lucky. We took three safaris, got three sightings. Here's the first sighting. You see how wonderfully camouflaged leopards are against this sandstone background. So this uh, was, a, I think it was a female, and it was about a kilometer away. I wound up where we were staying. Again, beautiful saris, goat herder, but lots of these Indian coral trees, sometimes called the tiger's claw, and they were in flower at that time. It was really lovely. Also, in a small pond nearby, we came across this poor old Indian bullfrog being eaten by a snake with an Indian pond heron looking on to see if there might be any leftovers. But the poor bullfrog is slowly dragged away. You can see clearer here. Here's the bullfrog. Here's the head of the snake. Nature in action. And that evening we went out again and got a second sighting of a leopard. And here we got a mother leopard, as you can see, again, well camouflaged. But with her were two cubs. Again, this was uh, somewhat over a kilometre away, so the shots aren't that great. But it was the two cubs, one of them, this one, was obviously biting its sibling, whacking it, trying to get it to play. But not interested so the first sibling walked off the next day we went out and early in the morning we were lucky enough to see sloth bear mother and two cubs and these are a very rare sight in there uh, listed as vulnerable they feed on fruits ants and termites sometimes known as the indian bear and again we got a leopard sighting, our third, and this time it was a male, and he was marking his territory, probably remarking where he'd already been, but you can see him sniffing there and then um, marking the territory. And he wandered off and then proceeded to have a bit of a back scratch on the, the rock face there, let, letting us know that he's a male. From Berra, we moved to Bayana where we stayed in the Royal Safari Camp, uh, which is in the Little Ran of Kutch. So different from the Great Ran of Kutch, the Little Ran of Kutch is, again, a desiccated uh, bare surface of silt, but uh, is also encrusted with salts, but not nowhere near as much as the White Desert in, in Great Kutch. So when the rains come, it turns into a coastal wetland. But the main thing about this area is that it was the sanctuary of the only home of the Asiatic wild ass, sometimes called the gudka. And it's one of the most endangered species in the world. We were lucky enough to see a herd of about uh, 20 to 30 wild ass. Here's a male posturing away, braying, and there's some mutual grooming that they were up to. Beautiful animals. <laughs> But even more beautiful were these lovely little white-footed fox that we saw, uh, sometimes called a desert fox. It's a subspecies of our red fox. And here we had a mother and two cubs. See the cubs playing with their mother here, fighting each other, play fighting, learning their skills. But most amazing, this lovely shot of one of the cubs sticking his nose into his mother's ear, which she didn't seem bothered. And then she starts giving him a little groom. Super cute cubs they were. From there, we went to a place called Moti Varani, uh, where we stayed at the Cedo Camp, Centre for Desert and Ocean. Bit basic, but 
perfectly acceptable lovely place there we got to see an indian jackal here you see it it's uh, sometimes called the himalayan jackal much bigger than our coyotes but similar looking but again very lucky saw a bengal fox with cubs now how do i hear here sometimes called an indian fox first of all you mute your mic and here you see the mother and a absolutely cute little cub poking its head out and even having another groom he didn't seem to like being groomed so they had a, a small disagreement with his mother which of course she won then we found out he'd got a little sibling so there was two cubs there and then a third one popped out so we had three cubs absolutely gorgeous they were From there, we moved on to a place called Gear, and we were staying in a, the Gear Birding Lodge here. Yeah, that is our room, very nice. And now that was because we were visiting the National Wildlife Reserve and Park, very popular with Indian tourists, because that's where you see the wild Asian lion. But it was uh, a bit ambivalent about the the place it's highly regimented paperwork to delay your entrance it took about 30 minutes to get things sorted which included paying a really excessive camera fee for any real camera you might say as in not, not a phone camera because they were saying we were professional photographers so we needed to pay a lot of money to them and they also provided us with an unnecessary guide we already had a guide the driver of the Jeep was much better at spotting and identifying birds than was the, the, the su supposed guide. We had to correct him on his idea of birds more than once. But they found us lions, as was expected. Uh, it's the last place in, in India uh, is to be found is the Gur National Park and surrounding areas. And other places in India have requested breeding pairs, but Gear won't give them up. They want to keep a monopoly on the tourist industry there. So we're lucky enough to see two young lions here with a kill. I think it's a, what they call a blue bull. We'll see that later. We also saw this mother with two cubs. Here's one of the cubs getting a bit of a wash and brush up. Bit of a clean there. And then his sibling pops out. So there's two cubs and a mother. <laughs> Lovely. Here's the blue bull, sometimes called a nilgai. Very, very large antelope, biggest in uh, Asia. Males can be 290 kilograms, females 210. So quite large. Lots more of these, the chittle, uh, spotted deer. So lots of those around and the, these two the chittle and the blue bull were the main food stuff for the lions there's a, a nice male here and here's a couple of does also some water buffalo in uh, in the river nearby they see them throughout india and we got leopard sighting number four this time we we're a bit lucky it was only about uh, 100 150 meters away very hard to spot in the undergrowth but once you got it it was quite easy to see it's just resting up next day we went out again and saw some more lions chilling out and this uh, lioness adult was at a water hole and then came towards us, fortunately decided to turn away at the last minute. But a good sighting of a lion. Unluckily, we never got to see a, a, a male with the full mane. But we got another leopard sighting, number five, for our trip. Very happy about that. This time, he was only about 50 metres away. Beautifully camouflaged in the yellow-brown leaves. As a side view. So from Gear we went to Velavada. 
where we visited the Black Buck Safari Lodge. Again, more camera fees for professional photographers and an unnecessary guide. But we were lucky there. We saw an Indian wolf. It's a few uh, packs of wolves in the in the park. Saw a grey mongoose, a number of Indian boar, wild boar. And of course, lots of black buck. That's the main antelope within the park. Here's a male posturing. He's calling out to attract females. We see these beautiful spiral horns that he has. And you can see that adult males are uh, black. The younger males, they've got the horns, but they're still brown, same color as the females. And they're very good at leaping, has this sequence of four shots of a male running away from us. Again, a couple of shots there, beautiful male black box. We also were lucky enough to see uh, a jungle cat. I know it doesn't look particularly different from a regular cat, but uh, apparently it is. They're sometimes called a reed or swamp cat. Very shy animals. You don't get to see them too often. And this is what I wanted to see was the striped hyena. And we looked out on the last day of our trip, uh, went to where their den and they were out checking the uh, the black buck in the background to see if there was anybody limping, I guess, see if it's worth hunting them. But yeah, nice. I like hyenas. This is the striped hyena. <laughs> And strange thing, uh, one of the, what I call a target bird, a bird I'd wanted to see, is called the Saras Crane, and we hadn't seen one all holiday. And on the last day, we're driving back to Ahmedabad to catch our flight home. And as we were entering the suburbs, our driver spotted the Saras Crane in a rice field on the highway. So it screeched to a halt on the hard shoulder. And I took some shots through a window. And as you can see, there was plenty of traffic going by, but did manage to get a shot of the Saras crane. So now I have a little time. I'll just quickly go through some of the birds we saw. There's the Shikra. It's a, quite like our Cooper's Hawk. Here we've got one with a, a lizard snack. Some more birds of prey. The Great the Spotted Eagle and Montague's Harrier. Uh, the black-shouldered kite, the white-eyed buzzard, and this, we're very lucky to get a close-up shot of a peregrine falcon. Never been as close to one before. Beautiful bird. Plenty of owls. There was the short-eared owl, Indian scops, and spotted owlets everywhere. Very, very common bird. And this, the brown fish owl. Here we, we had an adult, and there was a fledged chick nearby looking quite uh, a bit nerdy, I would say. And one of the shots I just wanted to point out, we got this shot here and you can see this translucent membrane. It's called the nictitating membrane. And it's a, a third eyelid that birds and other species have. <laughs> one of my favorite birds is the paradise flycatcher. And this is the Indian version of it. And uh, like this, the sunbird, both the paradise flycatcher and the sunbird, they're found in uh, Africa as well. In good in Gujarat, this was uh, we only saw purple sunbirds. This this guy's in eclipse plumage. You call it. It's halfway between breeding and non-breeding plumage. But you can see the bill there for feeding on nectar from the flowers. So the sunbirds are the equivalent of our hummingbirds. These are sort of magpie type birds, one called the Sirkia malcoa, quite rare. We were very lucky to see that. And then this much more common rufous tree pie. Looks like a sort of rufous colored magpie. My, one of my favorite groups of birds is the woodpeckers. We saw yellow crowned, black rumped and brown capped. Uh, some ground birds, sand grouse, 
grey franklins and Indian quarter, all with colorations to make them harder to see on the ground because although they all fly, they're not the greatest flyers. Some other beautiful birds was the coppersmith barbette. We heard this more than saw it. It constant metronomic noise, which obviously sounds like a coppersmith beating it, beating on the copper work. But we were lucky enough to get a decent view of one of them. We also saw this lovely bird, the hoopoo, We've seen them in Africa as well. I'd love to get one with its crest opened up, but I've never managed to. Here's a lovely rosy starling, a crested bunting, quite a elegant bird. Uh, a bird we get here, the snipe, uh, here, but also they had the painted snipe. It's a, a sort of uh, a water bird, as is the bittern. This was a yellow bittern that we flushed out from some sedges and it took this ungainly flight pattern away from us. Spot bill duck and the comb duck. It's got this strange little lump on his beak. Lots of storks. This is the Asian open bill. You can see that there's a slight gap between the upper and lower mandible there. Uh, the black neck stork and the very common painted stork. See that throughout India. The beautiful demoiselle crane. They were just um, at the start of their migration. So we saw these early on on the trip, but by the end of the trip, there were none to be seen. They'd all gone. This is a, a black wing stilt in the foreground. More water birds, the common Indian pond heron, this one having a very bad hair day. And the lovely, elegant Western reef egret in its breeding plumage, these extra plumes only, only when it's breeding. Black ibis and the glossy ibis. Bit like uh, the sacred ibis you can see in the southern part of the US. And again, the purple swamp hen is a bird you can see in the southern US as well. Quite a beautiful bird. Lots of flamingos. We had both greater and lesser flamingos. Here there's a little uh, bit of a disagreement between two of them, Just trying to peck at each other. Another one of my favourite groups is the kingfishers. This one's a white-throated kingfisher. And we also saw a common kingfisher. Peacocks everywhere, but these are wild birds. These aren't uh, like you might see in stately homes of Britain. These are uh, the real McCoy. The beautiful green bee-eater, saw a few of those. It's the only bee eater we saw actually in Gujarat and Rajasthan. Rose ring parakeets everywhere. And you see here, their pair bonding is very strong there. Lots of mutual grooming. The cute Indian robin. See, we saw that everywhere. Here's the female and the male. Got this lovely rufous rump. Bulbuls are common in India, especially this one, the red vented bulbul but you also saw the white-eared bulbul. And this one's a male displaying to a female, trying to attract it, her attention. This is a raven-sized bird called the Asian coel, a bit like a raven with red eyes. And related is this, the greater kukul, who's got these lovely rufous wings. Uh, these are ground-dwelling plover-like birds called the thickney because of this thick area here, even though that's not really the knee of a bird. This is the Indian thickney and the much larger, greater thickney. This one we were lucky enough to find on a nest, two eggs here. Some relatives of theirs, the lapwings. Here's the red wattled and the yellow wattled lapwing. And that is the end. Thank you. Thank you so much. What an amazing set of photographs. Let's end the show. We can stop sharing the screen now, Rick, if you could. I'm uh, just going to try and stop sharing. There we go. Thank you.
And let me... Okay. ...view this gallery. Excellent. Well, I, I, what can we say? That was uh, spectacular. Thank uh, you. Are there any questions or comments from uh, people who are in the audience? Yeah. Uh, I just like to know those temples, uh, yes. Hindu or Jain. Um, they're yep. so they're so remarkable. Oh, they uh, were. Are, they, are they done by those the Indian origin architects, or uh, are they being done? I mean, what period was it? Was it under colonial, or are they quite independent at those times? No, no. Um... There was a mixture. I mean, some of them, like I say, the um, Swami Narayans, uh, because he was a, an 18th, 19th century individual, none of his temples or, or temples that uh, if were in his honour, they wouldn't have been built until the 19th century. Okay. So in a way, as that was uh, during the Raj, and in fact, that one in Ahmedabad, the, the uh, land was given by the governor general of the area. You know, it's a, a, a bit hard to swallow that that the the British are giving back India to the Indians to build a temple. But that's how that was for the Ahmedabad one. Mm -hmm. And like the one in, in Buj, that was a rebuild after the 2001 uh, mm -hmm. earthquake had destroyed it. But the, the Jains go back centuries. I mean, one of the, it's one of the oldest religions in the world, I believe. I think, yeah. I, think I read that somewhere. Yeah. So there's a right mixture of things from I very see. early on to things that are a bit more mm -hmm. 19th century. I see. Mm. But they're all absolutely beautiful. Yeah. So who's, uh, I mean, the upkeep, <laughs> yeah. the, the renovation must be uh, enormous. It, well, the uh, we were told that uh, the the one that was rebuilt in Buj, for instance, and I say it cost a, around a billion rupees. The money came from um, emigrants, really. So uh, a lot of Gujaratis had moved to the US, Europe, and were making a lot of money, and they were the ones who funded it. So. Uh, basically wealthy expats, you might say, were the, the, the main contributors to the mm -hmm. the building of those temples. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, good thing that they do. <laughs> yes, yes. And they, I mean, the, it, it, it's perhaps like um, some of the European cathedrals, you see them and you think mm -hmm. this amount of wealth in the midst of poverty Yes. Yeah, guy. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? But I mean, there's certainly beautiful buildings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, there's so many worshippers were using them. So obviously, it's a, uh, a, a, a of major importance to the the local people. I see. <laughs> Remarkable. Yeah, there were. Mm. Any other questions, comments? Um, could you talk about how you arranged your tour, Rick? Uh, I could, yeah. Um, so the, the cultural tour, so-called, that was all arranged by someone else uh, within the group. One of my wife's uh, um, member of the hiking group had set up this uh, tour and two people had pulled out. So we, we came in to fill the gap at the, the last minute. And so that's how we got onto the cultural tour. We did basically had not much to organise for that at all. Uh, so because we were doing that, I then wanted to add on a, a wildlife tour. I wouldn't want to go anywhere in the world without having a wildlife tour of some sort. So that's, um, I just tried to f follow the company that I'd used for our Southern India tour found they'd been taken over by a much larger company and just used the larger company and all set up over the internet, very easy. And 
they were wonderful. They were just as good as the 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 smaller company that they'd taken over. Very well organized, and so uh, that was basically all I had to do. You just had to sort out, um, tell them what you wanted to see, what kind of animals and birds, and they would then suggest places. Uh, I'd look them up to check that there were going to be leopards because that was my main target mammal. Mm. And that's how it went. Yeah, we we never bothered with the tiger sanctuaries, which they thought was a bit weird because everybody wants to see tigers in India, but I didn't. I wanted to see leopards. <laughs> Thank you. Rick. Yeah. Did your tour group uh, choose the hotels and places that you stayed? Yeah, so the in both of them. So for the the cultural tour, that had all that was all sorted by um, a woman who was from Britain who had been uh, uh, hired, you might say, to to set things up, and she went through an Indian company, mm -hmm. which she uses. She's a, a regular visitor to India. She's uh, ab absolutely loves the place, and uh, actually. Her marriage, she, she got married in India, flew all the way from Britain to India to get married. So she set it up through an Indian company and they arranged all the the accommodation, the uh, the bus that drove us all around. We had to organise the internal flights that we needed. And then the wildlife, yeah, I once we'd sorted out what we wanted to see, they arranged all the accommodation. And that that was a bit of a mix. There were some really nice ones that I showed uh, of the safari lodges and that. But there was one or two of the places we went mainly for birds. They were a bit rough. <laughs> but but nothing as rough as our Ethiopian experience. So yeah, you win some, you lose some. Well, again, Rick, thanks so much for a very fantastic talk and photographs. And uh, this ends our uh, travel group meeting for this year. We are not having anything in December because we're approaching the holiday season. And we'll start back in January. And I am planning to give the first uh, talk in January, and I will talk about my experience earlier this year visiting Morocco, which I found to be a most fascinating trip. So I hope many of you will join me for that. Um, the date and everything is already on the um, Web Emeritus College website. And I think you'll see also the upcoming uh, sessions in February and March. If it's not there already, it will be there soon because it's being sent to the office or put in on the website. But thanks for all of you who've attended. Again, thanks, Rick. And we'll see you in January and hope that everybody does well and has a great uh, uh, holiday season. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Ed. Thank you.